This time I'm going to be talking um, about sheep health uh, plans, flock health plans, or flock health and production planning, referencing a little bit to some work we did in the north um, between 2016 and 2019 in hill, upland, and uh, lowland flocks with um, a set defined sheep health plan and what benefits we derive from that, and say a little bit as well um, in passing about the current sheep scab um, initiative being undertaken by the Northern Ireland Sheep Scab Group that is actually in progress at the moment. So we'll touch on the need for flock health planning, what context it's in, I won't spend too, too much time on that. The basis of flock health planning, which is the nuts and bolts and the practicalities, which is perhaps the most important part of it, and then just a little bit about um, the future of, of, of flock health plans. Basically, the bottom line of a flock health plan is that it has to lead to better returns. It has to be lead, lead to better production or more valuable production. And of course, there's many a pitfall along that pathway because the final market value of the produce is usually completely beyond your control. And the benefits of a flock health plan may grow or may diminish depending on, on the final market price. But that is a fact of life and it is no um, reason in any way whatsoever not to undertake um, a flock health planning. But certainly better health leads to <coughs> excuse me, improved production and lower losses. Better welfare, welfare quality and food chain safety, and I'll say a little bit about that in a wider context in just a minute. Better sheep with improved health status and, and reduced wastage, particularly at key times of year, lambing wastage or reproductive wastage overall, um, neonatal or young lamb wastage, maybe to higher losses um, amongst finishing lambs in, in the autumn due to pastoralosis or, 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 or whatever. And I think if we, and certainly we found during the project, we didn't, everybody learns a bit. The vets learn a bit, I learn a bit, the farmers learn a bit. So we do improve, we do improve our knowledge base, which is, which is important. EU and UK animal health and welfare strategy is still very, very closely linked. And is part of the proactive approach to food chain safety. There is little definition, there is little difference at EU or UK government level in food chain safety and animal health and welfare. They are under the same umbrella, they are part of the same package. And as certainly across the water we move towards um, farm support packages which will be much more environmental um, than previous and the actual commercial support will be much diminished and the commercial um, aspects of the sheep enterprise will, will be much more competitive um, in an open market, this kind of thing is, is extremely important. And the health plans link into the overall strategy of surveillance, risk management, measuring, monitoring, and review. And it's only by this approach that we can detect, for example, emerging diseases or changes in, in diseases which um, are mundane and everyday, but are still very important. And an example of that would be sheep scab in Northern Ireland at the moment and the emergence of strains of scab which are resistant to some of the commonly used um, injectable, in injectable products. We base a plan around routine visits, which are either undertaken on farm and certainly in the first year of somebody going through with a health plan that probably would be t undertaken on farm but thereafter may be, may be undertaken in the veterinary practice by you driving into there and having, having, having a meeting within, with, within the practice and it's based around the so-called shepherd's calendar weaning, flushing, tupping, pregnancy, lambing, lactation rearing and weaning. When we go through the sheep year those are, I think, the key events, and this is how we try and bring our visits into place. So, for example, you may have a visit, you know, pre-lambing, for example, to check that everything's all right. That would be your pregnancy visit. You might have a pre-lambing visit. You then might have a visit at weaning. So pre-lambing and weaning, and then again sometime mid-pregnancy will be the three times that I would actually, actually, actually visit these flocks. And I think the reasoning for that, the reasoning behind that, will become more clear later on. So the planning basis really, first of all, is so-called flock audit. You've got to know where you are and what it is um, you're dealing with at the starting point. 
you've got to establish or improve your recording systems because without a decent recording system, you're not going to really be able to pinpoint where your true problems are and you're certainly not going to be able to monitor the effect of anything that you try and do um, about it. And very often in some of the flocks, well, many of the flocks that we were dealing with in the north, the recording system really did have to be, um, to be kind about it, tinkered with quite a bit before you could get useful information out of it. Um, in some other cases, in some other flocks, the, the um, recording system was very good. It was bang on right from the start, and that saved an awful lot of time um, at, the be at, the be at the beginning of the establishment of, of, of a flock health plan. You've got to identify areas for intervention, and I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Those are the areas where you're not doing as well as you might be. Either you yourself feel that you're not doing as well as you might be, or you might be part of a focus group or a business development group or whatever, where you are being compared directly to your peers, and you realize from comparison of results and everything through that group that there are areas that you would, you would need <coughs> um, to um, improve. You place a program into place, which I'll say more about in a minute. You then monitor the effect of what you've done. You define the problem that you have. You decide what you're going to do about it. You do that, and then you come back and look at it to see whether that is worthwhile continuing with or whether you didn't get um, sufficient benefit from that or not, and you adjust as, as necessary. So the program itself, what sort of things will we be considering as the basic building blocks of a flock health program. If you say, I have a flock health program in place, what are you looking at? First of all, the vaccinations that you may be using, and there are several and many vaccinations that you may use in sheep. Clostridial disease is most certainly, you know, in my opinion, mandatory in any sheep flock, regardless of whether it's in the hills or whether it's on, on the plains. Clostridial disease and sheep go hand in hand, and we still have a very high incidence of clostridial disease among sheep in the north, certainly, and I know across the water as well. And a lot of that is due to either non-use of vaccines or incorrect use of vaccines. <coughs> vaccines will only work if they, if they are used correctly according to manufactured data sheet. Pasteurella or pasteurellosis, a lot of people... Um, will say that this is mainly a problem in, in lowland sheep and in intensively reared sheep and this sort of thing, but there's no such thing. I mean, say I have seen very severe pasturella problems in um, hill flocks, both with pneumonia in, in young lambs in the spring and then particularly with the so-called type T disease or septicemic or blood poisoning form of pasturellosis in, in, in the autumn. And the new generation pasturella vaccines, which are not, uh, not that new now, they've been out a good, a good, good, good few years, are very effective and uh, much more effective than the first generation pasturella vaccines. Enzootic abortion, toxo, still the two most common causes of abortion in um, sheep among, in, in Northern Ireland, certainly anyway, including in hill sheep, very much in hill sheep in, in some circumstances, particularly with EAE. Vaccines are available. There are more vaccines available now than before, which has introduced some competition into the marketplace, which, which I think is a good thing. Foot rot, off, and louping ill, louping ill particularly if you are in, 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 in tick areas. Antihelmintics, wormers, antiparasitics, very important, very important indeed. Can be linked with fecal leg count, monitoring programs, and, and everything else. But I would say of all the group of therapeutics that we use in sheep flocks, probably our wormers and the um, porons and what have you that we use to kill ectoparasites, ticks, flies, scab, very, very important. But their usage has to be con constantly monitored. The rationale behind their usage, the program of their usage, and the monitoring of that program has to be um, very, very good these days, very, very sound, because we do have resistance problems. We have Hantelmintic or wormer resistance problems to the white drenches, to the yellow drenches, and to the clear drenches. And certainly, um, with regard to the white drenches, that resistance is very, very extensive indeed and has, begun, has gone, I think, beyond being dangerously um, um, extensive. Scab, lice, ticks, fly strike, all important in a, in a, in a, in a, in a hill um, um, environment. And to say particularly the emergence relatively recently, certainly within the last two or three years, 
of strains of sheep scab mite which are um, resistant to the or some of the commonly used um, injectable products which we have been relying on for the control of sheep scab more or less exclusively since the um, demise of the or the virtual demise of the OP dipping. And certainly in the north now there is a resurgence um, of OP dipping usually being carried out by professional dipping contractors because we do have this, this problem of, of resistance. And then trace elements, the trace element supplementation of both ewes and maybe lambs, such things as cobalt, selenium, and um, copper, though copper, obviously, with considerable care. You would then include in your plan your routine treatments. What are you doing as a routine? Young lamb treatments, colostrum supplementation, how, why, and when, which supplements you're going to use and why. Are you going to use cow colostrum? Are you going to use surplus ewe colostrum, which is very rarely actually available, or are you going to use artificial colostrum um, supplements? Your hyperglycemia and hyperthermia protocols, any selenium and vitamin E um, uh, uh, injections in, 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 into neonatal lambs, and the use of antibiotics. Are you using antibiotics for joint hill, for example, are you using antibiotics for watery mouth? If so, why? What other alternatives have been looked at? What, what other things are being done? Antimicrobial use in those circumstances, in my view, in my personal view, is justifiable if it is part of a health plan. It is part of a controlled and justified and monitored use. Because if you're going to drop antimicrobials, for example, in a flock with joint ill, unless you have alternative strategies that are actually working, you're not really going to get very far. You may have dropped your antimicrobials, but you've got a heck of a health and welfare problem on your hands. So your antimicrobial antibiotic usage worked into a, a, a justifiable plan is much, much more um, acceptable. Lameness control problems, foot bathing, yes, I think we'd all get it's a question, question of what you use. Culling, use of antimicrobials, again, flock treatments, blanket flock treatments can rarely be justified, but there is the five-point plan, for example, um, to combat lameness, and use of antibiotics as part of that plan, as part of a sheep health plan, is perfectly justifiable. And then mastitis control would be something else that I would usually work into these flocks. What about profiling then? What about actually knowing what is going on in um, the sheep, at the ver particularly the ewes, but also the lambs, at various times of the production cycle? And this can be very, very important in hill sheep, where, you know, as we know, you know the, the influence of the weather, the influence of the ground that they're on can be, can be substantial. I like to see trace element profiling of ewes um, at weaning. Um, that gives you an idea of their status at the end of lactation before tupping, because a lot of trace element deficiencies um, will have an adverse effect on, on, on fertility. You would also, um, I think, be looking at your lambs at that stage, because we do know that more or less, regardless of the vitamin B12 or cobalt status of, of lambs in the hills and in the lowland um, situation, they tend to be depleted with co cobalt and vitamin, and vitamin B12 immediately after weaning. We don't really fully understand why that is, but it is a consistent finding that regardless of the status of your use, your lambs are likely to be low in vitamin B12 and cobalt after, or cobalt and therefore vitamin B12 after weaning, and therefore you will see a substantial growth check in those lambs. And we would actually have a more a strategy now of, 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 of treating lambs around like six weeks after, after um, weaning with vitamin B12 and also with a dose of the orange wormer, monipantel, the orange wormer, to which there is no reported resistance as yet, <coughs> just to clear out any resistant worms. And we see, um, you know, and this can all be worked into your plan, and it give you a big benefit in terms of, of, of lamb growth in, 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 in the autumn. Metabolic profiling of ewes pre-lambing, in my opinion, can save an awful lot of trouble at a later date at lambing. Sometimes this isn't particularly easy to do in the hill situation because of the, the sheep may not be available, they may still be up on the high hill and they may not be coming down um, for, for lambing ju just, just yet. But if it can be done, then looking at their protein energy status, their liver function and their minerals, about four to six weeks pre-lambing will save a whole load of bother at lambing if any one of those is, happens to, to be wrong. 
because most of the so-called metabolic diseases which you see at Lamy, twin lamb disease, hypocalcemia, what have you, are linked to this protein energy balance in the U during the immediate pre-lambing period. And I don't think a lot of people, until you've actually looked at them metabolically, appreciate just how knife edge late pregnant ewes are in terms of how easy it is to actually drop them off their feet um, by putting too much of a load on them, be that a, too much of a handling load, be that too much of a, of a pharmaceutical load, if you want to call it, with sort of mixed um, multi-drug therapies or, or what have you. So I think knowing the trace element status of your ewes and lambs and the energy and protein status of your ewes and lambs, and however large a grazing group you've got, you probably need to do only between four and six sheep to be bled in order to get an idea of where, of where, of where you're actually standing. Abortion investigation protocol is absolutely vital. Um, normal losses, stroke abortion rates <coughs> in sheep are very, very low. If you've got between 1% and 2% abortion rate, you've got a problem of some sort. Some people will come in and they will say, oh, I think I've got a problem with abortion. I've got 5%, I've got 5% 7% aborting. And you think, yes, my friend, you do have a problem. You have a big, big problem at, at, at that level. So the only way really you can reliably diagnose abortion is through, labor is through laboratory submissions, through the DAFM um, um, labs. And remember with abortion submissions, you're not only ruling in, you're ruling out. Because you want to know, is it EAE? Is it toxo? Is it a salmonella? Is it a campylobacter? If it isn't any one of those, don't think you haven't got anything out of the abortion. About 60% of sheep abortions are not, are not um, due to an infectious cause. But you have, if you've ruled out Campylobacter, ruled out Salmonella, EAE, Toxo, you've got quite a long way down the line to actually sort, sorting where your, your problem is. And particularly for leg count monitoring, this does tend to get neglected in the hills, um, largely because of problems of gathering sheep and handling them and everything like that. But don't assume just because they are on the hills that they are going to be the low parasite burden. That may not be the case, particularly during the immediate pre, uh, post lambing period. And certainly when lambs are weaned and come down onto the parking pastures, you can get quite a heavy buildup of, build of worms. And remember now that the type of weather that we have um, in... United Kingdom and Ireland, is perfect for worms. Today, it's lashing down, and it's 11 degrees C. Perfect. Perfect. So there's no such thing as the winter die-off, the winter kill-off. You know, worms are more or less a 12-monthly occurrence these days because of the, the, clients, the, the climate that we have. A full management component is optional, and I mean, say very often, where I would certainly leave the um, management component of, of, of a health plan to the CAFRI advisors, the CAFRI sheep advisors, who would talk through most of the, af the aspects such as, as, as nutrition, for, for example, grazing management, breeding policy, that's not really my, um, my remit. But some of, the, some of these things are very, very important. And the one thing that I would point out is quarantine. There's a lot of stuff out there that if you don't have it, you don't really want to bring it in. For example, you know, and I'm going to start with some of the difficult ones first. The Yagziti is very difficult to keep out, but you don't want that. You certainly don't want to, to bring in EAE if you can help it. You certainly don't want to bring in resistant strains of gut worm or of liver fluke if, 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 if you can help it. So you do need to have, and there are now available, you know, detailed quarantine programs to, to, detail with, to, um, to, to, to deal with all these things. Medicines use, we know that you have to, you obviously you have to record your medicines, medicines use. Losses of ewes and lambs, that's very important because if you don't record them, you don't know that you've lost them. And certainly when we were starting with the, um, with the project, we did see um, an awful lot of people who, when they started to count their lamb losses and look at them and everything like that, realised that they were much, much higher than they had actually expected. So what sort of things did we want to do when we went through flocks in Northern Ireland and we looked at the um, 
flock as a whole, the part of the auditing process that I referred to before, and then looking at things that we wanted to try and improve, where we felt things were going wrong, where things could be done, could be done much better. Reduce abortion rate and or lamb losses, that was a feature in a couple of flocks, and in one of those, enzootic abortion was, was um, diagnosed through our, through our um, abortion screen. Reduce lameness, lameness as you, you might expect. Reduce handheld mintic use by applying SCOPS principles. Very important to get um, a sustainable, I think is the word I'm looking for, worm, worm, worm a program. Reduce mastitis, ha ha, difficult one that, um, but a lot of people would always have a go at it. And then reduce or remove specific diseases, and particularly there, and in the hill flocks particularly, we were looking at OPA or Yagziti and, and Yonis the so-called sort of iceberg diseases, but when it's a question of seek and you shall find, unfortunately, with, 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 with both of those. You've got to ensure records can be kept. And I, I don't, there isn't one system suits all recording system. Eblix a few years ago did a very, very good template for a recording system, which is still out there. Eblix is no more, but their, their template is there for posterity. That is a very good template to base on. Whether they're kept in your diary, whether they're kept in a bespoke, you know, in a bespoke record sheet like the Eblex sheet, or whether you have record sheets as part of your sheep and flock health plan, which we had, we had bespoke record sheets. It doesn't really matter how you keep these records. You keep these records whichever way suits you the best. But you have to have those records there in order for you to analyse what's going wrong in the first place and what the effect of your interventions are. Cost of intervention, profit, basically what you're looking at, how much did it cost you to solve the problem and how much extra cash did you earn through sorting the problem and what is the balance between those two? It's called partial budgeting, I think, but that is basically the, the sum that you have to do. And as I said right at the start, some years you will get a good benefit from a plan because the, the, the price of your, your produce will be good, but then in other years there will be something else that, 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 that will happen and land prices will, will, will not be good. And of course, things that was referred to by the, by the, the first speaker, such as increasing in um, price of utilities, increasing price of feed, um, increasing price of everything, it seems, is something that you, you, you can't really do much about. But the benefit varies from flock to flock, it's the main focus of the adjustment. If it's not working, don't do it again. Depends on initial standards, depends on success and increase in output, depends on income from sales of output, and it is really as simple as that. How much did it cost, do we reckon, to put in all the... Play how much, what is the cost of setting up a plan in the first year? We would reckon something around about £300 is a ballpark figure, but it does depend on size of flock, amount of work that needs to be done and everything else. Thereafter, costs should reduce... Um, but you will still probably end up, I think it's only fair to point out, with a heavier use of, of something or other, be it vaccines or, or whatever. Yeah. The future would be, um, I think that certainly in the north, we feel that we need to go along the lines that has happened in, in England and Wales with the animal health pathway, where there is now sort of government support for sheep flock health planning. We have started with our Northern Ireland Sheep um, Scav Initiative. That's a very small, uh, but not a very, that is, a, that is a smaller sort of target, if you like, than the much wider um, um, concept of, of health planning. But I think that given the changes that are coming along in the sort of agricultural sort of support systems, if you like, and the need for commercial competitiveness, that enthusiasm, obviously, from, from, from the sheep vets like myself, from the farmers like yourselves, and also from the governments to provide appropriate packages is very important because I think having played with, um, having played with um, sheep flock health planning for a long, long time, it is now getting closer and closer to the actual date where we're going to have to make it work. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention and I would just acknowledge the folk who helped me along with this, colleagues at AFBI, DIRA, who provided quite, quite a lot of the cash, Ag Research, who provided the farmers who, um, eBlix for their data recording, and then the, the sheep farmers and the vets who actually took part in the project, uh, without, without whom, of course, it would never have happened. Okay.
Thank you, Jason, for a very detailed um, presentation. Um, so look, there's roving mics going around there for anyone who has any questions. And remember, you can scan that QR code on the left-hand side of that sheet there that was inside in, in your proceedings. So just while there's any questions going around, um, Jason, I suppose just a, a quick one there, I suppose. You know, um, I suppose, again, it's, it's very important what you've gone through there and you've, you've highlighted in part. But again, how, how do we get that buy-in, you know, with cheap farmers again, to, 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 to buy into planters? I think, to be honest, you have to get the buy-in from the vets first. That's what I think. You have to get the practices um, that are interested in sheep health planning and who will provide the plans. And probably standing behind the vet practices, you need some sort of national plan which they can use, which is the basis of the, which really is the basis for the animal um, health pathway in, in, in England and Wales. I think you need that first. We got buy-in from our farmers in the north in two ways, really. First of all, they were the go-ahead sort of first users, which you would expect. And secondly, when they started to see the cash benefits of what was actually happening, that's when you got buy-in. That's when they went to their business development groups, stood up and said, look, we've tried this and it works. But I bring it right the way back and put it back on my own profession. We have to be able to provide the plans that work. And my way of thinking of that is that um, rather like the British Cattle Veterinary Association did and rather like I think veterinary um, Ireland have done is provide templates for these plans. I think that's what we need. Okay, okay. Michael, have any questions? Yeah, we time? have a couple of questions there on the Slido. Um, Jason, the first one there, maybe just a quick one. What does AEA and OPA stand for? Oh, right. Enzootic abortion of ewes, sometimes your know, chlamydial abortion, sometimes short and just do enzootic. And then OPA is ovine pulmonary adenomatosis, commonly known as Yagzikti and is a slow progressive pneumonia of sheep, particularly common in hill sheep. And although it's what we call an iceberg disease, um, in that it is slow and insidious, it's very, very destructive in a flock once you, once you have it. Okay, very good. And then the second question there, um, if I can go with that, um, Grane, is, is it only injectables that sheep scab are becoming resistant to, or is it the dips also? It's not the dips, it, it, it's, it's not, it's not the dips at the moment. It's not the dips at the moment, but what I will say is that what we have, and I, if I'm wrong about the Irish market, then tell me, but I don't think I am. On the UK, and I think in Ireland, there are no dips that are licensed to be used through jetters or showers or sprayers for the treatment of sheep scab. It's an untruth that you can put a product that is formulated for dipping through a shower or a jetta or a sprayer and get the same effect. So if you do use a sheep dip through a shower, a jetta or a sprayer, you may get a dampening down of the um, infestation. You will not cure it, but what you will do is expose those mite populations to a low and persistent level of OP, and that is exactly how resistance develops. And it can happen. They're not bulletproof. There are resistant strains of scab in South Africa to OP dips. So it's not a never, never can't happen. So it's a good question. There's no resistance yet. But if we misuse them through, dip, through showers and sprayers, there could be. And then we would be in a real mess. If you've got to dip your sheep now, you're in a big enough mess, let's face it. But it could only get worse if your dip doesn't work. Okay. Uh, one last Mark, question, yeah. Grania, if I can, yeah. Um, so, and this question is, is antimentic resistance a, as big a problem in hill sheep farming systems as it is in lowland systems? No, I don't think so. But I think that certainly when it comes to the white drenches, even in the hill flocks, there is a very, very um, high level of resistance. But there is less use of worming product in hill flocks than there is in lowland flocks. But keep in mind as well, with regard to the long-acting 
um, moxidectin injections and other long-acting, you know, clear, clear injections, we have used a lot of those for the control of sheep scab rather than the control of gut worms, and that has exposed gut worms to those products and created resistance. So in hill flocks, if you do have a heavy use of clear injectables for um, control of scab, you can create resistance, and some hill flocks do have resistance. With the white drenches, apart from nematodirus, which is still a very, very important use for the, for the white drenches, I think even in hill flocks, you have a very high level of um, resistance. And some of it, I won't go on for too long, is generated within the flock, but quite a lot of it can be brought in. Okay, um, any questions from the floor? I know we've one more, probably, and so I go, yeah, we've, <laughs> we get a mic, we've... That's because we don't know what to do about it. So the question's on prolapse. Prolapse is difficult. Yes, it is. It's very, very difficult. What causes it? Um, if we knew that, I think we'd be cleverer than if we knew about mastitis. But certainly heavy lamb load has something to do with it. Heavy feeding during the last, you know, was, can happen. I can, I, I'll go with a, with a hill flock that we had a prolapse problem in and maybe tell the tale of that. Prolapse, hill flocks, some of them explosive. What was happening there was they were coming down relatively late into sheds to lamb and they were being fed very heavily over quite a short period of time. And the diet that they were taking in was fairly bulky. And what we did in, previous, in subsequent years was to start feeding lower levels earlier even outside, and to build up more gradually and to get a more dense diet. Because what I think happens with these prolapsing ewes is quite simple. There just isn't room in the abdomen for a uterus with two lambs in it, a rumen, you know, that's expanding with low dry matter content silage or, or, or whatever, and the pressure just has to give. But I think that if you feed hard, with bulky feeds over a short period of time, you know, pre-lambing, that will predispose. So high dry matter silages, so, you know, high dry matter silages are better than low dry matter because you don't get this filling up of the, you know, with, 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 with water and slop. And then the other thing that I have seen, um, which can predispose, but this was, this was a lowland flock, it wasn't a hill flock, we had a bad outbreak of prolapse in one particular pen in, 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 in a big house that happened to be near where the straw bales were stored and they were eating a lot of the straw. And when you PM those animals, they were their rumens were absolutely packed with straw because it's fun to pull that out of the bales and eat it and everything like that, as well as the silage that they were eating. So it's bulk of diet, speed of built up of bulk of diet, weight of lambs. I'll take two more questions. I think there's, just, there's a couple of hands up here in front, yeah. So I'll just take two more questions in the... Con same. Um, John Joe Fitzgerald here from the Irish Nature Hill Farmers Association. Um, on the build-up of resistance um, to the cypermectins and the ivermectins, and for an organic farmer um, that cannot use the organic phosphate dips, and you're left using the cypermectins yeah. or the cypergard, like in the future if we develop so much resistance to the cypermectin, and we're not allowed to use the organophosphates, um, what will be the reaction or what will be the solution to that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. At the moment, it doesn't really seem very obvious that there'll be one. But one thing that I will say, to, so you don't go out like total despair, it's not like... Um, I'm, I'm overstaying my welcome here, I know that, but it's not like... Wormer resistance, where if you have a population of worms on a, you know, on a, on a, in a flock that are resistant, say, to a white drench, they're there. Even if you don't use a white drench for 10 years, if you come back, you use a white drench, you'll, they'll immediately resurge. If you have OP, if you have moxidectin resistance scab and you clear it out of the flock, then that's it. Slate clean, start again. 
Now, I know that OPs, it's going to be very, very difficult to use them in, 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 a, in, um, in um, organic flocks. I totally appreciate that. But the only thing I can see at the moment is there will have to be some middle ground where under those circumstances, as a one-off, with resistance having been proved, it is permissible. And the disposal and everything else taken care of. Because otherwise, there, is, there, there are no products, and you can't, you can't farm with scab. So I've not much comfort for you, I'm afraid. Right, so um, the microphone's going to turn left. Just, just in the kind of time, I know, Jason, you might be around. No, I'm around. Yeah, yeah, so like, yeah, if we yeah, take yeah. one question, just stay on time. So the microphone's going down here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the flocks you work with, how big a problem is tick toxemia in, in, in the, those hill flocks? We don't see pyemias very often, you know, the stiff sort of crippled lambs. Tick-borne fever, as an underlying problem, we diagnose rarely, but that's because our diagnostic tests are limited. There's no other reason for that. But certainly in a number of our flocks, we do, in hill flocks, we do see higher than expected levels, say, of pasteurolosis, particularly pasteurolosis is a disease that I would pick on, even in vaccinated flocks, because of the immunosuppressive effects of tick-borne fever. So we would have, I think, quite a substantial, do have a substantial tick-borne fever problem in our ticky areas, which we really detect through increasing pasteurella rather than diagnosing the disease specifically itself. We can diagnose the disease by sending samples through to Scotland, but very often we suspect tick-borne fever um, underlies, say, outbreaks of pasteurella pneumonia in the spring and early summer, um, or may have something to do with septicemic pasteurellosis, blood poisoning, in, in, in the autumn. Okay, thanks Jason. So I know there's a lot of interest there, just a lot of questions come up for Jason, so just that we keep on track. Um, Jason, you're on later, so look, um, I think that some people might have questions afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah super. Yeah, thanks yeah, Jason. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so look, just to show you, run past Jason, just to...